This is what college is for. I think that's the best thing that you could learn in college, and that is how to teach yourself to learn. Let's talk about my method. I call my method the read, write, and explain, or the rule of th All right, welcome back to the show. It's been a while. If you're new here, my name is Dr. A. I'm a social professor of economics at Northern Kentucky University, and today we need to have a talk been on my mind. I've had this conversation this week actually with my students, so I thought might as well have it with you too. This is a big struggle. It's a huge struggle. And this is the struggle of the science of learning, how to actually learn. And it's a big issue, especially with people transitioning from high school to college. I know it was a struggle for me. I almost failed out of college because I did not know how to learn. And College challenged me to figure out how to actually learn, and you're learning so much in such a little amount of time. So I see this also in my classes today. Students are struggling. So one of the things that I do as a first year educator in my principal level courses is I teach my students how to learn. This is actually a common complaint that I hear from students, and they think it's a negative thing when they say it but you'll see this in evaluations or I'll hear students talk about it in the hallway. They'll say, this class, I actually had to teach myself the content. This is what college is for. I think that's the best thing that you could learn in college and that is how to teach yourself to learn. Today, I wanna to talk about some learning methods, which ones I use, how I modified them, but it's important when we have this conversation that you're gonna to have to try these out and see which ones work for you. It's a trial and error thing. It's not gonna come easy. You're gonna to have to push yourself to learn, to learn what works for you. The first method is called the SQ3R method. And in this method, there are several components and every letter in this acronym stands for something. So S is survey. Q is what I call question or query. And then the first R is read, the second R is to recite, and the final R is to review. We're gonna talk about each of these in more detail. S or the survey is the first step, and this is what I always do whenever I have actually a reading assignment, a problem set, or even a project that I'm working on. I will take a survey of the things that I need to cover. So I'm not going to a lot of detail. If it's a reading, I'm gonna look through the chapter, skim through it, see what the headings are, what are the subheadings. If there's a table, I'll look at the table. Any figures, I'll look at the figures and just get a lay of the land. Survey what's ahead of you. And here, you're trying to get an understanding of what you might be reading. And that brings us to the next step. The next step is to question or query, or at this point, you're gonna stop before you actually read the content and ask yourself, what am I expected to learn out of this chapter? What would be my takeaways? Some of the headings that I saw, what do they mean? And what you're doing over here is you're building a connection with the content. You're making it personal. How does this matter to me? Why does it matter to me? And in doing so, you're going to develop a natural curiosity towards the subject. And that's going to keep you reading and engaged more than just reading for, you know, because you're required to. So building that connection, making the content personal is an important part of the learning process. Don't neglect that. The first R is to actually then spending, spend the time reading the content. Here you're going to keep in mind what you've surveyed and the questions that you've developed and you're gonna to try to read to answer those questions that you developed. And this is an active process, so don't read just to get through it. Try to build connections as you're reading, keeping in mind the questions that you have. The second R is to recite. Here, you're after you've uh, completed a section of the reading, you're going to stop and say, this is what I have learned. And what you're trying to do is to uh, retrieve some of the information and that's part of the learning process. 
So what did I just learn? Say it out loud and then get back to reading. And then finally, review. So you read, you recite the content, and then after you've done all of that, you still need to review what were the overall main points, what did you learn, and how do these concepts connect with each other. That's an important part of it. As a faculty member, I recognize how many of the things that I'm covering in class connect with each other throughout the chapters, but often my students don't see that connection because they're learning the content for the first time. And you have to push yourself to see how each chapter is connected to the other. They're not standalone chapters. You're building a narrative over 16, 15 to 16 weeks, and each part builds on itself. And it's important for you to recognize how those things are connected. Let's talk about my method. I call my method the read, write, and explain, or the rule of thirds. I don't know where I heard this. Some educator influenced me to think this way, and it's the way I process things. So read is self-explanatory, but I wanna make it clear that reading to me means that you have to be actively engaged in the reading process. It's not passive reading. So this is highlighting, underlying, uh, underlining your content. And a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of research over there looking at whether underlying and highlighting actually works. For me, it does, right? Because it forces me to be engaged. And also when I'm highlighting and I am underlining, it gets me to my next point, which is the writing. After I read something, I like to write what I learned. And I use the highlights and the underlining to make those connections. I'm highlighting content as I go, and then that helps me with writing it. After I'm done all of that part, I still have the final third. And that final third is to explain what I just learned to somebody else, whether it's a family member, whether it's a friend. In fact, I attribute this to, uh, this to the reason that I got through grad school. I would always study, write, read, write, and then I would explain it to my cohort. I would just get a study room and I would go through the content with my colleagues. This way, they would tell me if they learned something different, but for me, I was really teaching myself. And I guess that's why I like being a professor because it allows me to continuously learn. They say the best way to learn something is to teach it. So that's my method, the read, write, and explain method. Which brings me to the Feynman technique. Richard Feynman is, uh, was a Nobel Prize physicist and his real superpower was his ability to take these complex ideas and make them digestible. And if you hear that, then you will hear some of the things that I often say about my ability to take economics and make it accessible to more people. And I, I really love this, this technique. It's similar to the read, write, and explain method. It just varies slightly in one area. The Feynman technique says, choose a topic that you want to learn, learn it, and then try to explain it to a 12 year old. And the reason you wanna pick a 12 year old is because this requires you to strip away all of the jargon and use your ability to explain it in clear and concise way so a 12 year old would understand it. And if you can't do that, then it means you do not truly understand what you're explaining. And therefore you have to reflect, refine, and continue to simplify your message Till it's clear and a 12 year old could understand it. That is the Feynman technique. I love it. It's similar to the read, write, and explain, but it goes into this uh, expectation that this information should be accessible to as many people as possible and get rid of that jargon. So let's talk about some common mistakes that students make. The most common mistake is students under invest in the learning process, especially when they're starting off college. You know, in, in high school, for most of us, things came to us naturally. Uh, we just had to hear it, we understood it, we might read a little bit and then take our tests or write an essay and everything was fine. But when you get to college, the expectations are higher. So students often that first year under invest in the learning process and it is my job to tell them what the expectations are 
Showing up to class and attending the lecture is just one part of the learning process. Reading the book is just one part of the learning process. You must be an active participant in learning. So find the system that works for you and really learn how to teach yourself. For the rest of your life, you're going to be expected to learn something new. The sooner that you know how to teach yourself new things, the easier life is going to be. Learning how to teach yourself is going to save you a lot of heartache and headaches in the future. Tell me if this worked for you or if you have a technique of learning that works for you, leave a comment. I'm trying to share this content with my students so they know that they're not alone. Uh, any comment that you leave will be greatly appreciated for them to know that there's different ways of learning. See you next week.